So uh, what this is called is a bolder way forward specifically for Utah. And let me just go back just a little bit and tell you more about um, um, what I've been doing. So really, I started 15 years ago in 2009, what is called the Utah Women in Leadership Project. I'm a leadership scholar um, and was asked by the governor's office here in the state of Utah to do some research on why more women weren't going to and graduated from college. It was supposed to be one year and then two years, and then it, it has continued. And our mission is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. We do that in three ways. One, to produce relevant, trustworthy, applicable research. Second, to create and gather valuable resources, and then convene trainings and events that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. And uh, as was mentioned in my bio, I have published lots of scholarly books, a few books, specifically a workbook and a few books for people of my own religion, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in January, I actually published uh, a second edition of this global book that's used in universities around the, the um, world called A Handbook of Research on Gender and Leadership. Uh, 28 chapters on women's leadership in different ways from groups around the world. And from time to time, when people see all this work that I'm doing on girls and women, people sometimes say, do you not like men? Um, I'm like, yes, I do. I'm married to one. I have four kids. Three of my kids are uh, young men. I have three grandsons too. So you that's not it. And then from time to time, people do say to me, um, so to do all this girls and women work, you must have been raised with a bunch of sisters. So I thought I'd start out by showing you a picture of my siblings. So I can't see very many faces. Usually I'm used to seeing faces on Zoom. So so um, I'm seeing one face. Thank you for smiling. <laughs> Most people find this uh, interesting. I am. I was raised with six brothers, but I will tell you one thing that is clear is that we as women, 30 to 40% more than men, we will lean into work. We will lean into leadership. We will step forward if we feel a deep purpose, even more than men, if we feel that call. And for me, calling comes from, from God. It's a religious, spiritual. You don't have to be religious or spiritual to feel called, though. You can feel called because you're meant to do certain things. And I feel called to do the work that I do. And that leads me to the bolder way forward. So um, I, I am the founder, like I said, of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, also a pro professor. But I want to really tell you about a movement that has rolled out across the state. And we had a large launch on June 9th, 2023. And uh, I have to say that 2022 was a particularly restless year for me in considering how do we shift things for Utah and girls and women faster. And I'm not alone. So many of our collaborators did the same. So let me give you some background. So national and statewide studies continue to show that girls and women in Utah are not thriving in critical areas. And can I say, we're not alone. We are more conservative societies tend to have more issues. There's other states kind of like Utah not, and definitely other countries. But what we know is that year after year, con Utah continues to have high levels of domestic violence, sexual assault, child sexual abuse, gender-based discrimination. We always hit the rankings as the worst state for women's equality and have we have low levels of women's leadership representation in nearly all domains. And that includes politics, business, and other domains as well. And I have done work and some speaking at the United Nations and different global locations where we've looked at trajectories. How long will it take for women to reach parity with men in various things? So for the first time, though, in 2022, I took this to the state of Utah and, and looked at the research. And um, although, the uh, although the needle has moved slightly in a few areas, 
with its current trajectory, it will take three to four decades to make even notable progress. And I tell you, my daughter, I have one daughter and three sons. My daughter, this uh, much of this past year has been pregnant with twins. And um, as I'm thinking about James and Savannah, and especially Savannah, who, who are now almost six months, um, I, I, and I think about my other grandkids, I'm, I'm like, that's not acceptable. We have to do better than three to four decades. And so I am every day, I have two or three other speeches today that I'll be doing. I say it's time for Utah, and I would say other countries and states as well, to embrace what we're calling a bolder way forward. Because when we lift girls and women, we actually lift families. We lift everybody in society when girls and women are, are lifted, when we are able to use our voices and, and not experience the violence and so many other things as well. So um, if we are serious about ensuring that Utah girls and women thrive, we need to create change much faster than three to four decades or longer. And that's just notable progress. And, and so we are, this movement is that we are going to create this change by 2030 with a checkpoint in 2026. So when I started this last year, it was really a seven year movement. Instead of three to four decades, we want in seven years to, to make the changes needed. And that includes shifts from just outputs. A lot of us do stuff. As academics, we publish stuff. Um, a, a lot of people hold conferences or they offer trainings or different things and they count outputs. But we are shifting to outcomes. What is going to change in society, not just what we're doing? I hope this makes sense for all of you. And so even though I've studied societal change, organization development and change for decades, um, in late 2022, I was doing some speaking in Costa Rica at Congress down there. And I took two flights to Costa Rica, two flights back. And let me grab the book. And I read this book, and even though I had, I had where's my, okay, there we go. <laughs> I read this book called How Change Happens, Why Some Social Movements Succeed While Others Don't. So again, I've studied change for years, but this really inspired me. By the time I landed in Utah, I had a whole journal full of notes. I had the model, and I, I happen to be very spiritual, so so I don't know on an airplane if I'm just closer to the heavens or I'm trapped in a seat, so I have to like meditate or whatever. But by the time I landed, um, I had a plan. And basically this book looked at movements in the United States that had really succeeded and compared them against those who that had not. Things like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, if you've heard of that, gay marriage, the smoking, getting, you know, really significantly reducing smoking rates in the United States that were super successful and then compared them with ones, even if they had a lot of money, that just were not moving. And what was the difference? And of course, there's a whole book and lots and lots of research, but let me give you like two slides that tells you the, the gist of all of this. So it really is about the systems thinking. And I studied that in my doctoral work so many years ago. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So systems are made of, of interrelated, interdependent parts, but you can't understand a system by just understanding the isolated components. The relationship between the pieces and parts is critical, and that's the key to more boldly advancing a common cause. And in Utah and probably other places too, we're great at pieces and parts. We do stuff. We train, we do conferences there are in the last five years there's so many women's conferences i'll be speaking at two two of them later today um, um but but the needle's not moving so just doing more stuff what we call stuff here is not necessarily making the difference that needs to be made but we now need to move together as a system and the, and the book and i'm a leadership professor but the book calls it networked leadership so bringing the pieces of parts together, being strategic together, people still have their individual nonprofits and efforts, but can we shift as a system? And that is really the key. According to the research, successful movement leaders 
bring diverse coalitions together, movement leaders act as part of a larger network, positioning themselves to enable the parts of the system around them to succeed, and again called network leadership. It's really leading from the middle, bringing the efforts, initiatives, voices together that are working on specific areas of focus. So here is the model. Um, and, and I thought this metaphor of a wheel moving up a hill would change. But um, this is what I had, this is the name, but it has not, it's resonated with people. And so you see here is, is really this work on girls and women is an uphill battle, an uphill road. And a lot of the efforts and, and uh, programs have been filling in the potholes to make the road smoother. But I really don't think that this wheel has been able to move up the hill. And that's instead of moving the needle, we're calling the will of change, moving the will up the hill, right? And so what was interesting is I thought a bolder way forward would be a common phrase, but I was able to purchase a bolderwayforward.org and bolderwayforward.org. And, and that is, and as you can see, helping more Utah girls and women thrive. So that's the statement we're using. So, so if you look briefly at these, I won't go into too much detail based on time, but if you look briefly, we have five categories. So this is not like these efforts that have one thing. What I decided when I landed, everything is so intertwined. All of these things you're seeing on the slide impact each other. Health impacts finance. Health impacts childcare even and entrepreneurship and, and um, finance impacts domestic violence. There's connections across. So if we just took one and worked on it, that's not gonna be able to ensure that more girls and women thrive. And so this is a big movement. We have five categories as you see. And within those, there are a total of 18 and we call them spokes. And that, that term has kept going, spokes in the wheel. And so you can see we have safety and security from child sexual abuse, domestic violence, um, and, and so forth. This one is our great big spoke. Our biggest healthcare systems are the, the partners here. For everything we brought in, the organizations are already doing the work. We're not starting from scratch. We're just trying to get the systems thinking view and so our main categories around child sexual abuse, we have nonprofits working on it, are brought in and they're the leadership and they're, they're already pulling together people in unique ways. You can see home and family is really important here too. Um, and, and workplace. So it's not all about women in the workplace though. It's home, it's school, it's community. And of course down here, you can see political representation. Things happen when women are in the United States, in state legislatures, in Congress, in city councils, things are different. Women, and, and I could get spend hours on the differences in, in our thinking and, and all of that with in terms of, of how those play out. And, and you can see different things, but each one now, and we have wonderful spoke leaders, we have two to three to four on each spoke from major organizations and now some of them have subspokes, but they're all moving forward with working groups. We have, we launched about seven months ago, eight months ago now. And so we're into year one. We have a couple thousand people and hundreds of organizations already in. But to truly move things, we have to get to tens of thousands. We have to get to hundreds of thousands. We have about three and a half million people who live in the state of Utah. So not the biggest one, but but um, we also have 29 counties. And so we've been traveling to counties. We have 17 county coalitions already set up. So we will be to the other counties and we pull them together and have local groups start moving to move things forward on the rims. We also have things that permeate all of these that need attention like sexism, like male allyship. In identity, we have what we call impact teams in um, things like race and ethnicity, in LGBTQ, in uh, refugees and immigrants, disabilities, women veterans and military women and others. 
Here we have women's history and we have arts and music and that will help with dissemination. Um, and so there's so much going on, but the the build is is coming up. It's it's interesting. We don't know if we're successful to move the needle now. It's taken a lot of time, can I just say, to get people our, our leadership, it's like herding cats. We use that term in the United States. Um, so it it is a lot of work to even have them set what are called bold goals for 2026, 2030. That's been another experience all in, uh, and, and very challenging, especially to figure out the metrics on how do we move things forward. Um, and so overall, the overarching goal is to make Utah a place where more girls and women can thrive in any setting. And there's not one metric that can assess and measure that goal, but we have been working and now have on our website for each of the 18 bold goals, and we're linking those to measurable outcomes. And we continue to track national and state data and working with groups of professors and will to, to track things that nobody has data on thus far. But one thing before I conclude that I, I think is really important is that um, we're not just talking about training and development or public policy to really shift individuals and families and workplaces. We have to do a mix of things from advocacy to communication to grassroots involvement, mentoring, messaging shifts, philanthropy, research, you know, it it doesn't. And so understanding deep change, which is something I've been studying for years and bringing other people in is the way forward. So overall, uh, Utah must do better. I think we're not alone to ensure that everyone thrives. And our vision is not to lift girls and women at the expense of boys and men. That's the scarcity mentality. Instead, we believe there's enough for everyone through cooperation and collaboration, which is the abundance mentality. And as I said before, when we strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women, we're really strengthening everyone, including boys and men. And so we really do it with that, that insight in mind. And then uh, lastly, I just wanted to, I do love this quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Every society has its protectors of the status quo and its fraternities of the indifferent who are notorious for sleeping through revolutions. And today our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant and to face the challenge of change. I love this. I think sometimes we're sleeping and this is like, we need to wake up, we need to move forward with change. And so maybe we in the, in the state of Utah won't become the best state for women's equality, but we can, with this movement, become a national and possibly global leader in how to implement positive change for girls and women and their families in Utah. So this is a very bold movement, um, but we are getting, I, I'm working directly with the governor and uh, the state governor, local government, uh, nonprofit, profit, organizations to help shift things. And so it'll be a case study for people to watch and see how we do, but it is bold. But I would say again, to conclude, I don't feel like I have a choice. I think about my daughter and my granddaughters and they need a better community. And I would say other states and countries, we need a better world for girls and women. And we have to lean in to do that with our head, heart, and, and our hands. Thank you so much.